Section 4 You will hear part of a lecture about how to give a quality speech. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today I am going to cover the daunting task of giving a quality speech, a thought that makes most of us cringe. In fact, 90% of all people feel nervous about public speaking, about 10% of whom are described as genuinely terrified. Hopefully, when we are finished here today, you all will be in the 10% of the population who do not feel nervous at all. Did you know that lecturers tend to get more nervous if the speech they are giving is an important one? It makes sense, right? You probably wouldn't be nearly as nervous to address your residence hall about the proper use of the recycle and compost bins as you might be if you were asked to give the graduation speech to your entire 5,000 student class. So what is it that makes some people completely comfortable in front of crowds? Some people think that the ability to give a good speech is a gift that others are simply born with. This is almost never the case. Public speaking can be learned with practice. The first most important thing you can do to improve your confidence in delivering a speech is to prepare a quality speech. Honestly, while the content of your speech is relatively important, the audience will really only remember the last sentence you say. It is a good idea to structure the rest of your speech to lead up to this last point to really drive your message home. This is a good way to ensure that your speech is well organised. Once you are confident in the quality of the speech you have written, the rest is just about your stage presence. Let's go through some do's and don'ts of public speaking. First, you want to command the attention of the room. Do not, I repeat, do not proceed with your speech until the audience is paying attention. Even Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech wouldn't have made any difference in the world without the undivided attention of his audience. To continue with the I have a dream example, one of the reasons that MLK was such an effective orator was his ability to speak with passion and engage with his audience. That sort of charisma does not come from reading straight from paper. Don't get me wrong, it is a good idea to write your main ideas down on a note card, sheet of paper or something. But one factor that will consistently lead to a boring, forgettable speech is writing down your entire speech. Do not write your full speech down. If you are constantly reading your paper, you are not making eye contact with your audience and thus failing to really express the feeling that goes with your ideas. I advise you write one or two ideas, so if you suddenly draw a blank, you have something to jog your memory. If you've written a good speech that you believe in, those ideas should be sufficient to keep you on track. Once you have those ideas written down, give your speech a few practice runs in front of the mirror, into your sound recorder on your phone, or with a friend before it comes time to address a crowd. That way, you can hear how the ideas come across, make sure there are no abrupt transitions, and find out whether you are talking too fast or too slow. Timing is important. Make sure you time yourself beforehand to see how long your speech is. That is pretty much it. With practice, you'll be able to deliver an expert speech that engages and even maybe inspires your audience. Just remember, speak with emotion. No one wants to listen to someone reading from a script. As I come to a close in my speech, I'll point out that I have employed all of these tips that I have covered. I practiced my speech ahead of time and timed it, and I can even show you my one small index card with just three simple bullets on it. It's as easy as that.
Section 4. You will hear the beginning of a lecture about the Pleasanton Town Market. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. In the last few lectures, we've been covering the social and political pressures that influenced the rise of the rebellion of 1679. Today, I would like to focus on the Pleasanton town market. Now, why are we talking all about some market? It's not like it was the first market ever, or even a particularly large market. The Pleasanton Town Market is important because it is often mentioned in the literature found in the library. If you have ever been there, you have probably seen all of the handcrafted items sold there now. But what was originally bought and sold in the town market? In the beginning, the market sold products such as meats, furs and simple tools. Over time though, it became known as the place to find quality livestock. People came from all over the world to find the biggest and best cows, pigs and chickens. In fact, the profits from the town market became the saviour of a plummeting economy during a time of much turmoil. Not to be confused with the Reconstruction era, a period of rapid development came about in the 1660s as a result of the market's vendors contributing their profits to building up much needed public facilities and defence which would later make a huge impact on the outcome of the war. For many years the market flourished and began to draw in large tourism crowds in addition to the throngs of livestock customers. However, as revolutions in farming came about, more people moved to farms far from the city centre. Customers grew more and more reluctant to travel all the way to the town centre for their meats when they could easily choose to buy from local farmers near them for a fraction of the price. With such a fall in the profits of the town's major profit generator, some quality town planning was needed. In the mayoral election of 1668, a young man of little fame just barely claimed the popular vote, none other than the now legendary John C. Wiley. Wiley's first decision as mayor of Pleasanton was to deal with the quickly failing town market. The building with the large clock was a landmark that had symbolised growth in Pleasanton for a generation, Wiley decided to use the notoriety of the town market to set an example. During the historical Rotterdam Rebellion, Wiley gave all those involved lifetime prison sentences in the very same building. It stayed a prison for about 50 more years until they transported all remaining prisoners to other facilities and turned it into the historical monument today. Now that you know the basics of the history of the Pleasanton Town Market, I will introduce your next group project. I want you to make a short film based on the real historical events that occurred in Pleasanton before and during the uprising. I will give you some class time to look through the library's reference section, but you will be responsible for conducting further research outside of class. I suggest starting by looking for information on the market itself you'll find plenty of information. In fact, some students complain that there is actually too much information on it. On your own time, you could find family members of old war veterans to conduct interviews. Sometimes they provide wonderful insight that you wouldn't find in proper history books. But be careful, an interview that is riddled with bias is useless. I myself have some very old photographs here that you are welcome to take a look at for some inspiration. I'm lucky enough to own this one of Jim Wiley himself. Very interesting to see, but does not provide enough information to add much to your film. Feel free to take this film into whatever direction you choose. You could even do a crime thriller based on real outlaws. 
All you would have to do is look through the newspaper archives in the crime section during that time period. Try to get as much detail as you can, but you may end up having to draw your own conclusions. Okay, that's enough from me. So let's go on to. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. You will hear an introduction about an eco-friendly building called the Gherkin. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Today, I'd like to tell you about how UK architects are playing their part to address the issue of global warming. You have seen many of these iconic buildings while going about your everyday life, but you may not know how they are affecting your tomorrow. In two thousand and three. Construction was completed on the famous Swiss Rebuilding, or more informally called the Gherkin, a true masterpiece commissioned by the law offices of Foster and Partners. This is not the first ambitious endeavour of the firm; they are renowned for their various philanthropic environmental efforts. The Gherkin, with its cutting-edge green initiative and sharp design, is gaining recognition as an icon in modern architecture. You can pick it out of the London skyline by its unorthodox cigar shape. While its appearance is the obvious attribute at which to marvel, there is far more to this building than meets the eye. And let's face it, there's a lot about this building that meets the eye. The building helps reduce the city's carbon footprint in a number of ways. Just a quick note: in case you're not familiar with the term carbon footprint, get used to it. It's a buzzword you'll hear relentlessly to talk about reducing emissions. Think of it as the amount of harmful greenhouse gases that are given off into the environment by a single person, organization, or product. So, going back to the Gherkin building, perhaps the most obvious as well as the most significant eco-friendly feature is the glass windows, which allow light to pass through the building, both reducing heating costs and brightening up the workspace. The ingenuity behind the various eco-friendly aspects of the Gherkin has seen its fair share of publicity, both from serious and silly sources. In a recent April Fool's Day edition. One e-publication printed a story detailing plans to replace 50% of the current exterior with grass, which would not only make large steps in the name of sustainability, but also give the building the green hue that would truly earn it the nickname of the Gherkin. The only drawback is, as you may have guessed, that this story was an April Fool's Day joke and completely made up. In all seriousness, though, the building is setting a new standard of design that other architects and city planners just cannot ignore. The building's bold and cost-efficient design has won a number of architecture awards, including the Stirling Prize, the London Region Award, and the Empress Skyscraper Award, among others. 
The design comfortably accommodates a large number of offices while keeping maintenance and operation costs down, striking a superb balance between nature and the workplace. Nature is well and good, as long as the weather is nice outside. Given London's notoriously bad weather, the architects knew they must devise a quality temperature regulation system, and that they did. A special system designed to reduce the building's reliance on air conditioning was devised that cuts consumption in half compared to standard office buildings. There are atria that link each floor vertically to one another, forming spiraling spaces up the entire building. They serve not just as social common spaces, but also act as the building's lungs, distributing clean air from the opening panels in the facade through the entire building. The building isn't all business, though. It has its fair share of fun as well. At the very top, a club room offers a picturesque entertainment spot for company functions, private parties, etc., with a breathtaking panoramic view of the city. The creation of such an innovative structure has many wondering what the future of urban planning and architecture may be. Well, if the other projects currently commissioned by Foster and Partners are any indication, the entire city constructed with similarly eco-friendly buildings is not far in the distance. The Mazdar City development aims to create a desert city that produces zero waste and removes as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as it puts in. A huge feat in protecting our Earth. The Gherkin is a truly impressive feat, yet it is not the only one worth noting. Now to move on to another green initiative, I'll tell you about the Eden Foundation building found in Cornwall. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear a talk on the research of the behaviour of chimpanzees. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome back to my series of short lectures on apes. Today we will examine recent and historical breakthroughs on the behaviour of chimpanzees, otherwise known as chimps. The word chimpanzee is an umbrella term for two different species of apes in the genus Pan, which are the common chimpanzee or pan troglodytes, found in West and Central Africa, and the bonobo, or pan paniscus, which are found in the forests of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Chimpanzees belong to the hominidae family, together with gorillas, orangutans, and indeed humans. Current research tells us that the chimps broke away from the human branch of the hominidae family approximately six million years ago and remain the closest living relative to humans to this day. More modern researchers into chimpanzees have centred on their behavioural characteristics, once all biological and genetic factors have been ruled out. In this way, 
scientists have unearthed an unfathomable amount of similarities between human and chimpanzee behavior. Although much of this research has taken place through observation of captive chimps, the results are widely seen as an authoritative reflection of chimps living in the wild. Chimps live in large so called communities comprised of many male and female members, with the social hierarchy determined. By an individual chimp's position and influence. Through such research, scientists have found that chimps learn and adapt through observation of others' behavior. Once in power, the alpha male is often seen to alter its body language in order to retain power. For example, he might puff himself up in order to intimidate others. While lower ranking chimps are noted to behave more submissively, And holding out their hands while grunting. Female chimpanzees also have a distinct social hierarchy, with high social standing inherited by children. It is not unheard of for dominant females within a community to unite and overthrow the alpha male, backing another in his place. James Diamond, in his book The Third Chimpanzee, Suggests that chimps should now be reclassified in the genus Homo instead of Pan, and there are many arguments still in favor of this. Male common chimpanzees are, on average, 1.7 meters in height, weighing 70 kilograms, with their female counterparts being somewhat smaller. By comparison, the bonobo is slightly shorter and lighter, but with longer arms and legs. However, Both species walk on all fours and climb trees with great ease. Jane Goodall made a groundbreaking discovery in 1960 when she observed the use of tools among chimpanzees, including digging for termites with large sticks. A recent study claimed to reveal that common chimpanzees in Senegal have been using spears sharpened with their teeth to hunt. However, these reports remain unsubstantiated. Researchers have witnessed such tools, namely rocks, being used by chimps to open coconut shells and indeed crushing nuts with stone hammers. As scientific technology has developed, so too has our knowledge of the sheer extent of the chimp's intelligence. Research has now shown that chimps have the capability to learn and use symbols and understand aspects of the human language, including syntax as well as numerical sequences. As I mentioned earlier, the umbrella term chimpanzee is comprised of the common chimpanzee and the bonobo. These two subspecies are divided along the Congo River, with the common chimps living on one side and the bonobos living on the opposite side of the river. Over the past few decades, both of these subspecies have witnessed an alarming decrease in population density, with animal activists now working harder than ever. To protect those remaining and encourage procreation. In addition, next week's episode will focus more closely on how chimpanzees in captivity are able to learn things through imitating the behavior of humans, as well as how chimpanzees' behaviors have developed over many generations. Thank you very much for attending this evening's lecture. I hope you found it. Intellectually stimulating, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Good night. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. You will hear a talk on the history of football in Great Britain in the nineteenth century. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Great Britain is often hailed as the home of football, with talented players travelling from far and wide to play for teams in the English Premier League, one of the most popular football leagues on the planet. Today we are going to take a look back to the 19th century Great Britain in an attempt to trace the evolution of the beautiful game, as it is now known. Prior to the 19th century, the game featured a wide variety of local and regional adaptations which were later smartened up and made more uniform to create our modern-day sports of association football, rugby football and Ireland's Gaelic football. Even up to the mid-19th century, Shrovetide football, or mob football, was still widely practised. According to the rules of mob football, there were no rules. A player could legally use any means whatsoever to obtain the ball, such as kicking, punching, biting and gouging, with the only exceptions being murder and manslaughter. These games may be regarded as the ancestors of modern codes of football, and by comparison with later models of football, they were chaotic and had few cooperation. Towards the latter end of the 19th century, and moving into the early part of the 20th century, however, there appeared a newfound emphasis on moral values in football. Perhaps a more modern example of this can be seen in John Terry's suspension as England captain, following reports of his infidelity to his wife. Furthermore, as mob football died away, there grew a greater concern for players' health and general well-being, with many clubs affording their top players access to frequent medical checkups and treatment. Despite the presence of Great Britain's unique, state-funded National Health Service, football clubs are still seen today, providing team members with state-of-the-art healthcare facilities, with the top clubs even housing their own specialist doctors and physicians. Today, football is a key feature of school children's day-to-day -day education particularly for boys. With the help of football associations, all schools in the UK are boasting their own football teams. This mainly comes as a result of pressure put on schools and the government by concerned parents, who felt that football education taught their children valuable lessons and indeed vital life skills, such as teamwork and a drive to succeed. Nowadays, many of the UK's top football clubs provide training facilities and outreach programmes in an attempt to educate the nation's aspiring youths. As I previously mentioned, it was only during the 19th century that football in its uniform concept truly began to emerge. With footballers previously playing according to their own versions of the rules. However, it was not until the early 20th century that different players actually began to play according to these standardised rules. Prior to the 19th century, football was played by all the major English public schools, including the likes of Eton College, Winchester College and Harrow. In 1848, there was a meeting at Cambridge University in an attempt to lay down the laws of football. Present at the meeting were representatives of each of these major public schools, whom each brought a copy of the rules enforced by their own individual school's rules of football. The result of the meeting was what is now known as the Cambridge Rules, thereby uniting the rules from across the country into one simple document. However, the Cambridge Rules were not liked by all, and a new set of rules Thring's rules, compounded in the book The Simplest Game, became commonplace among dissenters. Across the country, improvements in infrastructure and public transport had a knock-on effect of dramatically increasing attendance to football games. Football quickly became a social event where spectators would meet friends, drink tea and chat about the good old days. 
As football became more and more popular, it was decided that more money should be invested in maintaining the quality of pitches, amongst other things, and there was even talk of installing seating for spectators. However, the question of who was to foot the bill quickly became a divisive issue, with many believing that the government should fund football's development as a national sport. But in the end, the onus fell upon Britain's local and regional football clubs for the funding and development of the Football Association. They became responsible for the upkeep of football grounds, began to pay their best players a small salary, and organised competitions against other local and regional teams. And there began England's Football Association, or the FA, as we know it in its current form, the governing body of football in England. As the FA continued to grow and accumulate greater wealth, it was able to attract more and more talented young men from across the country, before finally accepting professional talent in the early 20th century. Today, Football is played at a professional level all over the world. Millions of people regularly go to football stadiums to follow their favourite teams, while billions more watch the game on television or on the internet. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.